so I'm Rod Jackson, so I'm a, um, a cardiovascular disease epidemiologist. I, um, I, I trained in medicine in the 1970s uh, in New Zealand and uh, practiced for a few years and then um, had an opportunity in the early 1980s to go and work for a year in epidemiology with, um, with a guy by the name of Robert Beaglehole, who some of you might have heard of. His son, Robbie Beaglehole, is a dentist in Nelson and he's the the kids and teeth doctor. Yeah, he's the one who's been really um, pushing, he's uh, very involved in, um, in, 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 in trying to address the sugar problem. And some of you might have heard of Fizz, I don't know whether you've heard, it's a group that we've tried to set up, um, uh, which is fighting uh, sugar and soft drinks. And we called it Fizz, and it's, um, it's actually modelled on ash. Um, and in, in the early 1980s, Robert Beaglehole, the, the father of Robbie, <laughs> Uh, was instrumental in bringing ash, action on smoking and health to New Zealand and I was fortunate to be there at the time working with him and so a couple of years ago when we were talking about what we could do with sugar I came up with this name Fizz which was meant to be, you know, there's ash for cigarettes and we had Fizz for soft, we're just looking for something so Fizz is, and, and, and it was to be focused like the great thing about ash is it was focused on one thing, cigarettes <laughs> You know, it was, it was one of the nice, the nice things about, um, it, about trying to deal with something, a, a health problem, is if it's very specific, like cigarettes, it's a target that you can work on. And, and that's what we've tried, that's what we're going to try to do. Fizz is still very much in its infancy, but it was, um, we, we thought that overweight, uh, overconsumption, all of these things um, are big issues that cover so many, you know, it's not just about sugar, sweet and soft drinks, of course, but we thought that was one way that we could sort of get our kind of leg in, we could get our toe in the door and, uh, you know, sugar, sweet and soft drinks is something that you can focus on and if you did get rid of them, if that was possible, it would be, it's, it's somewhere between 10 to 15 percent of the energy that kids consume. It's in, in that order. So it's quite a big ticket item. It is a big ticket item. Um, but anyway, that's the history. So I started working with Robert and I spent the 80s working um, in public health epidemiology, mainly tobacco and nutrition, so, um, and particularly saturated fat. And, and I'm going to talk more about saturated fat this afternoon. Um, uh, but then I got involved in, um, I had to go and teach medical students and um, uh, in, in the process of teaching medical students, when I first started teaching them, I wanted to teach them all about saturated fat and tobacco and, and, and health, they fell asleep. <laughs> and, and they fell asleep because they were very, very focused on, actually, if you're a fourth year medical student, the thing that, um, that worried you when you got up in the morning was whether you could put a drip into someone's <laughs> someone's vein. And so I was talking about these big issues and they were just too big for them. So, so I got involved in, um, I, I, I started thinking, what is it that they need to know? And um, uh, it was very clear to me that, um, that what they really need to know that, that where I could help them was in critiquing the literature. Critiquing, because the, the, the literature, uh, when I went to medical school, uh, I think I went right through medical school without reading a journal paper article. I don't think I read one, seriously. We had textbooks and we had lecturers and you, and, um, but I know, isn't it embarrassing? I, I don't think I read a paper. But it meant that, and I'm 61, so if you think of most of the senior doctors in most countries in the world, most of the senior people, were not trained to critique the literature. They read the literature, bits of it, and they, you know, I mean, I've read some papers now, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Come and take a seat somewhere. And, and as you have, but, but, but it is important to realise that um, most of the senior people in all of our professions, whether it's medicine, nursing, nutrition, dietitian, um, their training did not involve critiquing the literature. And, and so, in general, we ain't good at critiquing the literature because the people who trained us weren't good at it, and, and a lot of them are self-taught. And, and so, uh, because epidemiologists spend their um, time designing and doing studies and making sense of the literature, I decided that was something that 
I could, could help them with. And I came up with um, this tool called GATE. And, um, which is a graphic appraisal tool for epidemiology. And it was designed, um, firstly, to keep medical students awake. Um, and, and the reason they were asleep is, one, the topic was too big, but also, um, you know, we got into, we made it too complicated. We made it too numeric. We made it, we, we didn't make it accessible. So I, I've spent the last um, about 30, since 1990, so about 25 years, um, uh, trying to make critical appraisal accessible and usable. So, um, so what I want to talk about this morning, what we're going to talk about this morning, is is, ma is a bit more generic. It's it's about how do you approach critiquing the literature. Then we're going to have a go at critiquing a randomised control trial, which is the one, uh, the randomised trial. Did you all receive it? Yeah, and it's, in the it's in the folder. But you have you read? Has anyone read it? No, you didn't get it sent out to you. Oh. We, we found it in the past. Yeah, that's cool. We sent it out. Yeah, it's okay. But it's, 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 it was a random, it's a randomized trial of a high-fat, low-carb diet versus a low-fat, high-carb diet, looking at weight. So we have a go at it. It's so the topics that we're going to cover today. But this morning is more about that generic, giving you an approach to critical appraisal. Okay? And... Um, and please, um, interrupt me at any stage. I'm one of those people who think it's rude not to interrupt. Because it's suggestion not listening. So, and if you agree with everything I say, then obviously you're not listening. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, please, but, um, but please don't hesitate. Um, I, I, it's good to make, this a, should be a conversation. We should, and, and, and we can make things go. But anyway, so the good news is you think, oh my God, critical appraisal, and um, uh, I'm scared already. Okay, so I teach it with one picture, two formulas, and three acronyms. Yeah, everything you need to know about critical appraisal. Well, the basics, the fundamentals, with um, one picture. So this is designed. Um, this this approach is designed to be accessible, to be um, that something that you can all take away. And and what I'd like you to go away with is a framework, which is this frame. That a framework that when you read a paper, you can hang it on the frame. That's, that's my design. It's called the gate frame, and, and it's a frame because you can hang stuff on the frame. And, and that picture, um, a triangle, circle, square with the arrows, and, and then the cross, um, the cross is a separate thing which I'll come to, but that picture of a triangle, circle, square and the arrows is the shape of every epidemiological study. Randomized trials, cohort studies, cross-sectional studies, diagnostic two sections, everyone fits into that shape. Yeah, so that's, that's my career in one picture. That's <laughs> what I do, it is what I do. And so actually when anyone asks, whenever I design a study or whenever, when anyone comes and asks me about the evidence, I use that picture. And for years I was using it in my head but then when I was trying to teach it and make it accessible, I realised that, um, to, you know, in pictures, most people like pictures. Um, they prefer them to numbers and, and words. Most, most people, not all, everyone, but, um, but I realised that that was the picture of my science. My par that's my paradigm. It's, um, that's, it. that's it. That's it. So let me talk, ab let me talk about it. And, I'm going to go through these. So you've already got the picture, <laughs> the one picture. So you're already part way there. Um, yeah, and I started working on this in 1991. So it's only, yeah, it's taken me 24 years to get this far. I think it's almost ready to publish. And, and it's been, I mean, the way I modified is, uh, and it's been, went through lots of modifications, is that I teach people and um, I see if they're still awake or if they glaze over, or if they ask questions. And so uh, it, it's been modified over, over that period of time. So it's taken me that long to make something simple. It used to be much more complicated. Okay. And uh, I have one class of 1,100 students um, in two lecture theatres linked by, um, it's really interesting to try to teach this. I teach it to about 1,100 18-year-olds every year, which is really interesting. And, I mean, I teach a basic version of it, but they are really, really, um, they teach you how to teach. They ask, amazing, they ask amazing questions. They ask questions 
that people like you don't ask because you think you should know. <laughs> but because they've never come across epidemiology or any of these things before, they, they ask these really great questions because they, you know, so, so what do you mean by, by that? And, and actually, I'm, right at this moment, I'm having this uh, quite serious uh, argument discussion with some of my senior colleagues where there's something that I use in epidemiology that, um, and, and I've defined something new that was taught to, me my, taught to me by some of my first year students. Well, it was based on some questions they asked me. They asked me these really, really uh, searching questions and it made me question some stuff that I'd um, been taught over the years. And, and, and to cut a long story short, um, I've now added something to the epidemiological literature, I believe, based on questions asked to me by several 18-year-olds. Mm -hmm. And my colleague, and I think, I'm, I think they were right, <laughs> but my colleagues have never come across it. <laughs> and so, but it's amazing what you can learn. Anyway, that's kind of a, irrelevant, I guess. But anyway, let's just go. Um, so GATE stands for, most, so it, it, it started as an appraisal tool. So I designed it to teach initially medical students and then um, when I say medical students, that's a starting point, but I've used this, I, I, I teach nurses, I teach dieticians, I teach people, I teach doctors, I, at all level. It's something that I, I use at every level. This is not meant to be um, medically centric, it's, it, it, it's, but it's in health. But it's also an architectural tool in that I use it to design studies. So the flip side of appraisal is design, so it's an architectural tool too. And in fact, overall, it's an, it's an approach. It's, it's an approach to epidemiology. Now, some of you probably, th I don't know whether some of you think that epidemiology is, is just about studies of whole populations, of course, but you know, a randomized trial is an epidemiological study, a cohort study is, a, a, a diagnostic test accuracy study. So um, I'll talk to you a bit about what I mean just by epidemiology, but it's, it's, it's actually um, the empirical science of health. Um, epidemiology is. So yeah, that's what happened to my students. <laughs> um, but um, no more, no more. They, most of them, I, you know, it still puts a few to sleep, but most of them uh, are pretty much awake now and they, they take this away. So, um, so I'm going to talk about GATE in four parts. Um, I'm going to talk about design, analysis, error, and then this thing that we call evidence-based medicine or evidence-based healthcare. I, I just want to touch on, on that um, as, as well. So one, this is design. So there's the picture. So, so I guess take home point number one. You said you can take three points home. Okay, I'll keep it. Um, with, design, with, with this, there'll be three, three or four main points with this. Point number one, every study can be hung on that frame. So when I read a paper, like paper, I draw these pictures, I draw triangle, circle, square, and arrow on every page, and as I'm reading the paper, I fill them in. And, because how many of you have read a paper and you're part way through and you think, God, what did they say? I, I didn't get that bit, and, 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 and there's bits you miss, and so if, if every study fits into something like, into this, then if you kind of fill it in as you go through, even have one on every page, and you do bits, um, then it can help, it, it makes for more efficient reading, more efficient reading. If, even if it's nothing else, it makes for more efficient reading. But it also helps you understand what they did. And, and here's, here's kind of one of the, you know, um, uh, standard traditional epidemiological studies. And this was a cohort study, and it's a real study. It was um, some, uh, a, a couple of epidemiologists in the early 1950s, um, sent a letter to every registered British doctor, and I think it was about 1954, 1955, and they asked them whether they smoked cigarettes. So everyone got this questionnaire, and then they allocated them by measurement, it was a questionnaire, to whether they were smokers or non-smokers. Okay? So that's this circle. So the triangle is the people in your study. That's the people, so the, that's your people in your study. And the circle is how they divided them up. <laughs> how they, in fact, we use this term allocation. How did they allocate them to 
um, the fact that they were interested in. And it was smokers and non. By the way, I'll give you copies of um, of these presentations. Uh, I'll make sure that they're available to everybody. And then, so there, there were smokers and non-smokers, and then the arrow was actually, that tells you whether um, they, they followed them up over time or whether they did everything at one time. You've heard of cross-sectional studies? A cross-sectional study is when you, and the arrow goes sideways with cross-section, you do everything at the same time, but we, we often talk about cross-sectional and longitudinal studies or cross-sectional and follow-up studies. Well, a follow-up study, the arrow goes down. And then what they did in the first instance, I mean, they've been, they're still following them, actually, but there's, they published one study where they followed them for 10 years and they uh, counted the number of people who got lung cancer in the smoking group and they counted the number of people who got lung cancer in the non-smoking group. So that's those numbers and then the people who didn't get lung cancer are here. So you've got the study participants, you've got what we call an exposure in a comparison group, you've got the outcomes, and you've got a time factor. And every study has those factors. So now I've, call, I've got a dotted line down here and a dotted, because I'm, sometimes there's more than two groups. Sometimes there's more than two outcomes. It, it just varies, but, but generically that, that, that fits. And, and so, um, so here's the first acronym. So I've got a picture in the back, and it's PCOT. And it's P for participants, E for exposure, C for comparison, O for outcome, T for time. PCOT. And I don't know, if any of you have been to any evidence-based medicine course, you might have come across the thing PICO. I don't know if anyone's heard of PICO. Yeah. So PICO is basically the same thing, but, um, but PICO was designed by clinicians, and, and the P was the same, but the E was... Um, their E was an I, it was I for intervention, because they were thinking of randomised trials. And the C was the same, comparison, O was the same, um, and I don't know, the T was silent, <laughs> uh, as in Harlow, isn't it? Um, uh, or Harlot, or whatever. Uh, but um, um, but T, the time, timing is important in everything, particularly in nutrition, time, yeah, very important. And, and so to an epidemic, so PCOT is just a generic, the epidemiolog epidemiologist's version of PICO. Um, but so every study has some participants. There's always exposure and comparison groups, well, pretty much always. Um, and there's always outcomes and there's always a time factor. So, so you've, got a tr you've got your triangle, circle, square, and your arrows, and you've got the labels. So that's the picture and the first acronym. Okay, so you're getting there. We're almost there. <laughs> and, and, and look at this. This is actually a randomised controlled trial. Another actual uh, real study that was done, it just happened to be British doctors, but this time, rather than asking them whether they were smokers or non-smokers, which is what we often call an observational study, because you observe whether someone's exposed or not. Have you heard of observational studies? Some of you? An observational study, it's, it's actually a bad term because... All studies involve observation, so it's, it's not very, it's not a very de good descriptor. But um, in, a, in, in, a, in a cohort study, um, if you allocate people to the exposure and comparison groups by observation or by measurement, it's called an observational study. If you allocate them randomly, it's called an experiment, a randomized control trial or a trial. And so in this, in this particular study, they randomized the participants to aspirin or placebo. In this particular study, they followed them for five years. One of the reasons they followed them for five years in, um, in this study, whereas it was 10 years here, is um, it's really hard to keep people in a study where you're asking them to do something, to keep them in a study for five years. They don't stay, they, 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 they won't do it. They won't do it. Whereas with smokers and non-smokers, certainly back in the 50s, um, they were already smoking. You didn't have to tell them to smoke. <laughs> they were smoking. And, and so it was easier. You could do these longer term studies. But of course, people move. People move. And by the time in the mid, by the 60s, people were, were do, you know, well, we were all told that you shouldn't be smoking and doctors stopped smoking. So there were major changes in here. Totally messed up the studies. <laughs> totally messed up the studies. And, um, and these people, you know, often don't. Um, there were some doctors here who um, 
when they started reading, they took part in the study initially because it was very unclear whether aspirin was worthwhile, but partway through the study, um, there was increasing evidence that aspirin actually did protect you from coronary disease. So some of the doctors, so they were, plus, they were the tablets were the same, couldn't tell the difference. Some of them sent them off to laboratories <laughs> to get them tested to see what it was. Um, you know, and, and so it again messes up the study. And, and you know, I want to, I mean, we're going to be talking about nutrition studies, but um, you can't do good um, nutrition, you can't do good studies, uh, you can't do good long term studies, you can't, um, you can do good short term studies of nutri in nutrition, short but long term, they're useless. Pretty much, that's and, and, and so all of the controversy we're having at the moment about, you know, saturated fat and, and all of these, th you know, whether it causes coronary disease, is that uh, people are hanging their their sort of opinions on crap studies. Uh, and 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 we'll talk about it. we'll come we'll be talking about that. But anyway, um, so this is the standard study, and so but it's good to you know it's good to think about this because you can just imagine okay. Take a group of, of, of people, however, and ask, okay, going to randomise you, so you have to eat lots of saturated fat for the next 10 years, and you can't eat any. Give me a break. It's, it should be a, one of those TUI ads. Yeah, right, you know. And, and that's why we have, the reason why these studies are so bad is, one, is that people find it really hard to do it, and... Um, some people move this way and some people move that way. You know, they'll read the north and south and some people will be convinced that I should be eating coconut oil. You know, for God's sake, you know, you know that, that stuff, sh you should keep that stuff away from your mouth. It should only be used on your skin and, and your hair. You know, it should not be consumed. But, but there's a lot of people now, and we can talk more about, you can raise some questions about that, but, um, but you know, I mean, there's, um, uh, it's really hard to do um, long-term studies in nutrition. Short-term, yes. Long-term, very difficult. Uh, cross-sectional study. So I talked about cross-sectional, and this was an overweight. So um, I've taken middle-aged Americans. We measure their BMI. Uh, well, we measure their height and weight, and we can divide them into different groups. I've put overweight, and I've put normal weight. And then if you measure their diabetes status at the same time. So you measure their height and weight and then you take a blood test. And if you do pretty much do that all at the same time, that's what a cross-sectional study is. So you're not following them up. So the arrow goes sideways when you do that. Um, so the arrow basically kind of indicates a point in time. Yes, yeah, the arrow, in, in, yeah. And, and uh, yes, it does. And, and sometimes we, talk, you know, we often talk about cross-sectional studies or prevalence studies, but um, um, of course, in a you know in a in in a randomised um, trial or even the cohort study. So let let's take this one: smokers and non-smokers, and you follow them up over time to. And so this is a longitudinal follow-up study. But what you might do is, let's say five years into the study or whenever, you could say, I'm going to measure lung function. I'm going to measure lung function to see you know how it's done. So then the arrow would go sideways. So in a Follow-up or longitudinal study, you can do cross-sectional measures. So, so um, these types of longitudinal studies can have both longitudinal measures. Now, when we measure things over time, like heart attack rates or lung cancer rates, we call that incidence. Those are, in, if, if there's events per unit time, it's called incidence, whereas if we measure things at one point in time, it's called prevalence, so incidence prevalence. But people often get... Um, a bit mixed up when they talk about cross-sectional studies and longitudinal studies. What we often, um, and it's important to, 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 to know that because, see, in this study, um, for example, um, you start with a group of people without lung cancer and you follow, follow them up, and so you've got smokers and non-smokers and you, you see where they get lung cancer, but you imagine if we go to this study, if um, this was smokers and non-smokers, and this was lung cancer and no lung, so looking at lung cancer, you could possibly find, can you imagine a situation where, so smokers, non-smokers, uh, and lung cancer, no lung cancer, 
it's possible that you might find no relationship. You might find that um, uh, there are as many smokers as non-smokers who have lung cancer. Now, do you know why that might be? Different types of lung cancer. Hmm? Different types of lung cancer. Uh, that's not what I'm getting at, but there are different types. But in, in this, this is a cross-sectional design. So you ask people, do you smoke? And do you have lung cancer? Are they previous smokers? Well, they're pre exactly. That's it. Because, and one of the downsides of a cross-sectional study is if, if you're a smoker and you get lung cancer, what's the first thing you do usually? Stop smoking. <laughs> so um, there's this thing that people talk about reverse causality or chicken before the egg. So, so what happens is that um, smoking does cause lung cancer, let me be clear. You're 10 times the risk of lung cancer if you smoke. But if you do a cross-sectional study um, and you measure smoking status and, and disease status at the same time, then um, what you don't know is whether in a, in a cross-sectional study whether um, people, whether what you ask them about their exposures has changed because they've already got this. <laughs> so actually this is a really good example because, I mean, actually we do find that overweight, if you look at overweight and normal people cross-sectionally, that overweight people have more diabetes than normal weight people. But if you ask these people, so if instead of this being overweight and normal weight, if you ask about sugar, sweet and soft drink consumption, so let's, let's just change overweight for sugar, sweet, and soft drink consumption. High sugar, sweet, and soft drink consumption, low sugar, sweet, and soft drink consumption, diabetes status. You could very well find that the diabetics have low sugar, sweet, and soft drink because they've been listening to you, mm -hmm. and they've stopped drinking sugar, sweet, and soft drink because they had diabetes. So it was like the diabetes came before their current consumption. Now, if you'd ask them, what was your sugar, sweet, and soft drink consumption up until when you got diagnosed with diabetes, it would be almost like doing a longitudinal study backwards. You know, you, um, so you do, these these things you need to be aware of. And when you read the literature, when you read the, when you read the literature, firstly, we're all so busy, the chances are you only read the abstract. <laughs> would you say most of you would just read the abstract of an article? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. You should never read the abstract. <laughs> I know. What you should, there's only two parts of a paper that, I mean, I'm being extreme here, but if you, but if I was really, if I was going to really challenge you, I'd say there's only two parts of a paper you should read, the methods and the results. Don't read anything else. Certainly don't read the discussion. Because the discussion is when the authors go beyond the findings. You know, it's the poetic license of science and, 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 and abstract. So, you, you know, um, in fact, it's interesting, Hen Henry sent me a couple of papers, I mean, so the papers we've got today are papers we've talked about, and um, just because you don't have access, easy access to all of the full papers, so you'd, y you sent me papers where you'd read the abstract, and some of them sounded kind of interesting. But, you know, for most people, that's all they have. That's all they have. And it's not good. <laughs> It's not good because there are so many myths out there, so many myths out there. And, and hopefully when we, when we critically appraise, the pa when we look at the papers that we're going to look at today, you'll, you'll get a sense of some of those issues. Um, so anyway, but these studies can be really useful, but they can be problematic. They can be problematic as well. Um, with that example you give also, people have a hard time remembering what their diet was 10 years ago. Oh, well, well, that's true. That's, that's really, actually, people have a hard time remember what they ate yesterday. You know, um, uh, actually, tr yeah, well, I mean, and, and we'll talk about this with this paper. How do you actually, ha ha you know, I mean, we, we, we try, I've been, I've done a number of studies where we've done food frequency questionnaires, and I have many colleagues that have done 24 hour recalls. Uh, crude as. They're all crude. Crude, 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 crude. And they're our best. We do our best. I'm not being critical of the people who do them at all. We do our best, but boy, it's inexact. It's inexact. Um, it, it, it's really. I, just another thing, you know, you, I mean, Henry, we, we were talking about, you know, um, thresholds and waist circumference of 80 and BMI of whatever. 
I, I have to say, you know, having spent over 30 years measuring stuff in science and, and making sense of stuff, I, I take no notice of, num of specific numbers. I use them as really, really ballpark. There's nothing special about a BMI of 25. There's nothing special about a BMI of 30. There's nothing special about any of things. They're just ballpark things. And also, what they're, and it's, I'm not being critical of the use of them because as a busy clinician, people want advice. And if they say, how much exercise should I do each day? And you say, ah, oh, you know, you know, <laughs> there's nothing special about this. Often if you say, you should do at least 20 or 30 minutes a day, it gives somebody a, it, it gives someone a, uh, you know, something to hang their, hang, hang their plans on. So, but, but I think it's really, really important for you to realise that, that most of these, most of the advice we give, and I'm sure you do, most of the advice we give about doing 30 minutes of exercise so many times a, a, a week or whatever, and that a BMI above this number is important, um, they're purely ballpark very arbitrary. There is absolutely nothing special. I mean, as you know, if you've got a BMI of 30.01, are you obese? And of 29.99, you're not obese. What a lot of crap, you know. It, it's completely, it's all ballpark. It's all very, very ballpark. And also the other thing is that if you look at the risk of disease, um, the ideal BMI is probably less somewhere, but somewhere between 20 and 25. Ideal, probably closer to 20 than 25, somewhere down there. I've got a slide I'm going to show you later about BMI and, 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 and diabetes. But um, it's continuous. There's no, you know, if you look at the relationship between BMI and disease, um, uh, BMI and diabetes, for, exa for example, that's it like that. Actually, it's kind of um, like that sort of thing. But, but whatever, there's nothing special that happens. There's nothing special that happens at 25 or 30. Nothing. Um, nearly everything in health is continuous. There are very few dichotomous things. There's very th few thresholds. Diabetes all d based on a diagnose, based on a blood test, you know, and um, and and uh, and uh, we now use today we use HbA1c. A couple of years ago it was all glucose, but you know, um, blood glucose is so last year. <laughs> um, it's all now HbA1c, which is much more sensible uh, actually. HbA1c, it's it's non-fasting. It's telling you about your average glucose over the last few months, so it's a much better test. But but we have this number. In fact, when they did this conversion of diabetes based on blood glucose to the equivalent of HbA1c, it, it didn't come up as a round number, so they made it a round number. Which was sensible, actually very sensible for, for communication. But don't get hung up on a don't get hung up on a number with anything. I uh, you know, as a as a professional measurer, I um, I am incredibly um, cautious about the meaning of a particular number. It, it's I always, it's kind of like you were talking about with Boyd and his consumption data that there's always a range. Always think of a range. Always think of a range. Ballpark. But from that ballpark, he still was able to derive some very useful. Absolutely, data. you can get lots of useful stuff. But 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 I think it's really important in your day to day practice is is to think about these numbers as ballpark. It is, everything's ballpark. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so that's cross-sectional. Okay. Um, on this is a study, this is a diagnostic test study where uh, a group of women, middle-aged American women, get a mammogram, and some are mammogram positive and some are mammogram negative. And then if they're positive, some of those who are positive get breast cancer, some don't. Some of those who are uh, mammogram negative get breast cancer and some don't. Now this is where you have to do cross-sectional studies because a mammogram only tells you whether you've got breast cancer now. It, it, it doesn't, it's not like a risk factor. Mammogram is not like, 
a, a positive mammogram is not telling you whether you might get breast cancer in the future, it's actually just looking to see whether you've got some mass. <laughs> and so that has to be done cross-sectionally, if, if you see what I mean, is that if you've got a positive mammogram, um, do you have breast cancer now? Now, of course, um, I mean, I, I know this is not what this is, this is about, but just to show you one of the things you need to think about is that actually, um, so when people do these studies, uh, they, the mammogram's relatively straightforward. You do a mammogram, and if you find a lump, then you can do another test. So if, so if they're in that group, and they're positive, that E group, then you've got something that you might then do a more sophisticated mammogram, you might do an ultrasound, and then you might do a needle biopsy to biopsy, and then you can decide whether the woman has breast cancer or not. So, oh, that's one of those, this is a screen. Oh good, I've, I've forgotten that this is a touch screen. So, um, so that bit is, uh, you can do cross-sectionally. Mammogram, needle biopsy, yes, no. But you can't do this side, because if you're mammogram negative, what are you going to do? You can't do that. So actually, in this study, part of it is cross-sectional, but what they do, if you're mammogram negative, they actually follow you for a couple of years to see whether you get breast cancer. And if you don't get breast cancer in the next two years or so, then they say, well, that was a, a correct negative mammogram. So I, I just raise this to say that when you look at studies, y there's stuff in there that you didn't really think about. But I've just, I mean, what I've just described to you, I think makes sense, doesn't it? You have to do it that way. So there's nothing, there, it's not rocket science. It's just that if you draw a picture, you can work it out. So, so, I, so drawing a picture when you're looking at a study can help you work out, a lot of the stuff is, you know, there's that whole thing um, that, you know, most stuff is common sense, it's just that common sense isn't very common. Um, <laughs> is that, and the other thing is that, um, uh, someone told me that, you know, academia is designed to make common sense more efficient, <laughs> efficient use of common sense. And all I, a lot of this is common sense, it's just that sometimes it helps to have tools to help you be able to go use your common sense. Because and, and, and I think often people look at a study and they say, oh my God, I don't know what they've done. I'm just going to read the abstract and see what they think the result was. <laughs> but um, one, of the, one of the lessons I hope I'm going to give you today is that the best critiques of studies are done by people who both understand methodology but also understand the subject. So it's, it's people like you who are dealing every day um, with, um, with, with patients and clients with their nutrition issues and trying to change things. You are the experts, but you need that expertise and this expertise, or you need to work hand in hand with people who've got the expertise of the design. It's the marriage of those two things which actually make good critique, is, is, is both the, the experience and, and the science. You, need, you do need both. Uh, oh, this is the other way. Uh, actually, what, so this is a study that I'm sure you'd understand. You do a mammogram, and does that mean I got breast cancer or not? That, that's the important thing. But um, there's, an, there's another study design. In fact, the, the more common design is that um, we do it the other way around, <laughs> um, um, is, is that we want to know um, so in this one, we want to know whether mammogram is good for predicting breast cancer. But in this one, we want to know whether if you've got bre breast cancer, the mammogram is good at finding it. it. It's a slightly different question. Mm -hmm. it's a, but it's, they're all related, you know, you do them both together. And in fact, you often do the studies the same way, but they're different questions. They're, they're different questions. And so in, in this one, um, you start, the, the exposure group now is not those with a mammogram that's positive. This is those who've got breast cancer, and you want to know, among women with breast cancer, what proportion have a positive mammogram? And how were they diagnosed with the breast cancer in the first place? Okay, so, so they diagnosed it by um, doing it the other way around. So, <laughs> so no, you're right. So, so in fact, these, 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 when, you design the, when you design those studies, you, you do them, you do the study the same way, you know, you have to, you start by doing mammograms, 
um, and then you identify the breast cancer. But you can ask two different questions. You can ask, how good is a mammogram at predicting breast cancer? And then how good um, uh, uh, Mammogram. But won't they all be positive? Won't it be 100% if they were diagnosed by mammogram? No. No, no, because you've said they've got breast cancer. So, yeah, yeah. So a lot of women with breast cancer have a negative mammogram. So how was it diagnosed? But how was it diagnosed is what I say. Oh, okay. Oh, how was it diagnosed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, wouldn't yeah, that yeah, be yeah, in yeah. the two-year follow-up? Yeah, yeah. So, about? yeah. So that's what, that's what happens. You do the two-year follow-up. So, so what happens, so that, good question, but that's a good answer, <laughs> is that... Um, is that in this in this one in this one here, um, some of those women who got a negative mammogram got breast cancer. So they got shifted to the other group. So they got sh so then, so in my next picture, those two groups become the positive yeah. breast cancer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, thank you for that because, and 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 the reason I've shown you both those slides is that. When we look at a study, we may come at it with different questions. We, different questions, and the the gate frame is is a way of both um, making sense of how a study looks, but it's also a good way of framing your question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's your question? So, um, so you know, the clinical question is, you know, if you have a positive mammogram doesn't mean you've got breast cancer. And it's something that's called the positive predictive value. Some of you might have heard that term or not, but it's positive. Um, but if, if you're um, um, in the Ministry of Health and you're trying to decide, should we introduce mammogram as, um, should we pay for mammograms in women f under the age of 50, for example, what you ask is, among women under the age of 50, how good is um, a mammogram at finding their cancers? Okay? And, and so um, among women with breast cancer under the age of 50, what proportion have a positive mammogram and what proportion have a new... So how good is the mammogram? And it's pretty useless. Uh, mammograms are pretty useless for women under 50. And in fact... Um, the ministry didn't use this data. It was a political decision um, to give women to do mammograms under 50. Probably uh, not a clever idea uh, because... And, and, and at the moment, you know, there's this big thing about bowel cancer testing. Should we be introducing bowel <coughs> cancer screening? So one of the sorts of studies, when, when you, first you want to look at how good is, um, is the screening test, then um, among people with bowel cancer, how good is the screening test that picking it up um, is, is one of the things. And then in fact, what people also do is randomised trials. Is You can do it multiple ways. You can go back and you can take a group of people and randomise them to a screening program versus no screening and then follow up and see who gets cancer. So there's, there's multiple different ways that you can try and answer the same question. And in fact, it's, it's, it's really often useful to have multiple different mm -hmm. Um, questions because they all help. Um, case control studies, maybe I won't, does anyone want to know about case control studies? So all case controls, again, I normally keep this for an advanced course, but um, uh, so all case control studies are actually nested inside cohort studies. So again, they're all the same design. So what happens in a, in a case control study, the starting point in a case control study are the people, the cases. So what happens is that, that um, so with smoking and lung cancer, in fact, one of the first studies that helped us, uh, that um, taught us about um, smoking and lung cancer was a case control study. So what they did is they, they took a group of people with, with lung cancer cases and they asked them whether they were smokers or not. So they put them into that group or that group. The, this is the... Um, so they all got lung cancer, this top group, but those are the smoking ones, smokers with lung cancer, those are the, um, those with lung cancer but non-smokers, so put them there. Okay, so they know those numbers, they, so they, they've got the square, they know the top bit of the square, but what they, what they don't know is whether 
people without lung cancer smoke or not? So what they do is they take a group of people without lung cancer and they ask them whether they smoke or not. Mm. And, and, and so you've got cases and non-cases, so you've actually filled in those, you've kind of got the information on those two boxes. Mm. What you really would have liked to have done is to know among the whole population who smokes and who doesn't, and, 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 and among those people um, who gets mm. lung cancer and who doesn't. But as it happens, if you've got those numbers, you can work out those numbers. <laughs> so in a case control study, you, you kind of, it's, it's a quick and dirty cohort study. You, you just get some of this data and then you can work out that. So I, I, those are all dotted because we don't actually get all of that information. But the great thing about case control study is you only have to, and, and, and you'll also see, even though I've got the square this size, um, the cases and the controls are only a, a smaller proportion. They're not everybody. In there. So case control studies are efficient studies, they're efficient studies. But they have lots of biases. I, I did a PhD, my PhD was based on a case control study. And I, you know, I mean, it was, a, it was something that you could do in New Zealand, it was affordable. Um, but I did another one on road traffic crashes a few years later, a, a, a case control study. And I did one more and then I stopped doing them because I think they're highly problematic. I mean, they've got some advantages, but they're also, they're also difficult. Okay, so $10,000. So um, uh, one of the things <laughs> I, I do is I, um, I have given um, all my students a challenge that if you can find a epidemiological study that doesn't fit in the gate frame, I'll give you 10,000 bucks. So there you are. There you are. So if you want 10,000. I was once, I was in the supermarket one Sunday night and um, I heard this quiet sort of voice behind me, excuse me, Professor Jackson. And I looked around and it was um, sort of an 18, 19 year old. And he said, um, I think I've found a study that doesn't fit the gate frame. <laughs> <coughs> now I still had the $10,000, so he was wrong. But, um, but anyway, it was uh, interesting. But I, I, as far as I'm aware, um, it's, a, it's a very simplistic design but there's always a population, there are always exposure and comparison groups, there's always outcomes and there's always time. And so.